Okay, so we're moving on to uh, the last speaker before lunch. So um, I'm guessing everybody's hungry, but please uh, refrain from just storming the doors uh, two minutes before lunch. Uh, please welcome Kyle Knapp, who's going to talk about dynamic class generation in Python. All right then. Uh, hello, my name is Kyle Knapp, and I'm a software developer at AWS, where I primarily focus on developing the AWS SDK for Python, also known as Boda 3, and the AWS CLI, which is a Python-based command line tool to manage your AWS resources. And I'm going to talk to you today about dynamic class generation in Python. So let me first go over what you should expect from this talk. First, I'm going to talk to you about the basics of dynamic class generation, mainly what it is and how you'd go about doing it. Then I'll talk about the benefits of doing it and when it is appropriate to use it. And finally, I'm going to build an application from the ground up that uses dynamic class generation and really shows you all the benefits you gain from it. So let me start by answering the question, what is dynamic class generation? What it is, is it gener the pattern is to generate classes at runtime. So all the functionality of a specific class or the definition of a specific class doesn't exist in the source code. And as a result, it gets generated as the program runs. And because the class doesn't exist in source code, and the functionality needs to be generated from somewhere else. In most cases, it's some other data source, such as a schema or API model. So let me show you a simple example of how you can dynamically generate a class. Here I have a hello world function that takes an object and prints hello world from that object. I also have a class that I call base class that takes an instance name as a parameter and sets it as a property. Now I call type. Usu usually if you're uh, familiar with using type, it usually takes only one argument and it tells you the type of object. But here, type can also accept three different arguments, where the first argument is the name of my class, the second is a tuple representing the inheritance I want this new class to have, and the third parameter is a dictionary representing the additional properties I want to add to this class. And once I call type, it will actually create my new class such that I can instantiate it as so. So now, if I was to introspect some of these variables here, if I look at the dunder name of my class, it will appropriately show my class. Next, if I try to access one of the properties, like instance name, it will appropriately show up as my instance when I access that property. And also, I can call hello world from this instance to get that additional functionality of printing out hello world from the specific object. So you're probably thinking, it's like, okay, that's cool, but why should I care about dynamic class generation? First of all, it can improve your workflow. Improve your workflow in the sense that you will, ha you will have to write a minimal amount of Python code to actually add new functionality. Maybe not, you may not even have to write any Python code at all, which is cool. Second, it can improve the reliability of your code. A lot of times, how dynamic class generation works out is you have a generalized code path and most of your logic flows through that generalized code path. As a result, it becomes more heavily well used and tested. Then third, it can actually reduce the physical size of your code because specific classes doesn't actually exist in the source code and therefore doesn't take up against the size. And finally, this is a production level pattern. I'll go into an application that uses it a little bit later in the talk. So now let me talk about some of the downsides of it. First of all, tracebacks are a little bit difficult to, tr to follow, mainly because a lot of times you're using a generalized source path or source code. And as a result, you have to look through the data the data source that you're uh, getting this functionality from to really identify where it's going wrong. Secondly, IDC, IDE support doesn't come right out of the box, mainly because IDEs need the source code to be able to auto-suggest and it simply isn't there. So now let me go into a production level application in terms of Boto3. Boto3 is the AWS SDK for Python, so it allows you to interact with all the different uh, AWS APIs available. And Boto3 is dynamic and it's data driven. It's dynamic in the sense that all of its clients and all of its resources are generated at runtime. And data driven in the sense that the functionality for these dynamically generated classes are pulled from JSON models representing an AWS API. And what those two qualities allow for me as a maintainer of the SDK is an efficient workflow because with AWS, it's constantly innovating, constantly adding new features and services. So being able to stay up to date 
and provide all these new features through the SDK is very important, but it's very difficult when there's a lot of APIs to work with. With Boto 3 and the fact that it's dynamic and data driven, all it takes for me is to simply update a new JSON model that's packaged in the library and I don't have to write any Python code at all and I'll immediately be able to take up that functionality. And I can spend my time doing some other work that doesn't, that can't be really handled with dynamic class generation. So now what I'm gonna do is show you a demo of what this would look like. Everyone see, see that? Cool. So now what I'm gonna do is open up IPython here. And now let's say AWS came out with a new service called my service. So if I try to create a client as client for my service, um, I will probably get a runtime error saying, this is not available. So let's actually go fix this. So what I'm gonna do now is, uh, so let's say we got a new API model for this service. And I'm gonna open up um, this model to show you what it kind of looks like. And if you look at it right here, it's just, it's just Amazon EC2's API model. It's nothing new here. And now if I, what I can use now is the AWS CLI, which shares the same data path as Boto3 in order to add this model to the same data path that they share. So if I provide the, for the service model, the file that I just opened, and then I provide a new, uh, say I want to rename the, the service name to my service. What that will do is just copy the file into the correct data path for Boto3 to search, such that if I open up IPython again, I can then use it. So if I import Boto3 and create, try to create the new client, it appropriately creates, and now I can actually just call one of EC2's operations. I'm just gonna do the describe regions call and it appropriately was able to make the call as well. So this, is really, this was really cool because I did not have to write a single line of Python code and able to add new functionality. So that being said, you're probably now wondering, when should I actually consider dynamically generating these classes? The one big point you probably wanna look for is if there exists some canonical source of data where you can actually pull functionality from, and better yet, if there's more than one application possibly using this source of data. Uh, a classic example is web APIs. A lot of times what happens is you have to update a model anyways in order to generate some of the server code. So being able to use that for the client code, you get to pick, up, pick that up for free, which is awesome. Then you can get in the case of databases where you have a defined schema and libraries kind of like Sandman are able to use that schema to create uh, dynamic APIs to interact with those databases. So now let's uh, actually build an application from the ground up that uses dynamic class generation. The application we're gonna build is a lightweight Boto3. It involves having a client interface where its methods are one-to-one -one mappings to the various APIs. And this application is gonna be all model driven. There's not gonna be any, any code that's specific to a specific API method. It's gonna be able to validate inputs based off models. It's gonna be able to parse responses based off models. And it's, for now, it's only gonna support JSON RPC protocol. So let me go over the steps real quick as well of what we're gonna do. First, I'm going to sh uh, show you how you can write a simple JSON RPC client. Then I'm going to integrate API models to pick up input validation and response parsing. Then I'm gonna add API specific methods to this application or the client interface. Fourth step, I'm gonna make sure it's extensible so I can inject my new classes. And finally, I'm gonna actually add more APIs. So for those of you not familiar with JSON RPC, let me briefly go over it. So JSON RPC relies on using post. Against a single URI where there's not any additional uh, pass or query strings you have to worry about. And most of the data is in JSON bodies through the request and response. So like in the request, you will specify like a method or parameters you want to provide that method, and a response, it will return you a result from that method call. So now let me go over uh, some sample code of how the JSON RPC client work. I don't worry about looking through it too deeply right now, I'll walk through it with you. So now if I was to try to instantiate this client with an endpoint URL, it will save that endpoint URL for later when I try to make an API call. For the make API call, I, all I have to do is specify a method and parameters, 
such that the method gets mapped to the method element in the JSON payload I'll send, and the parameters will be mapped to the params element. Then once I have that payload set, I can just use requests to just send a post to that URL with the JSON document. And what it'll return to me is a, a JSON document as well, where you can see here it'll have the result of multiplying one by two by three together, which as you would expect would be six. So let's talk about what needs to be expanded on this. This feels very general. There's honestly, you don't even need this, this client class right now. You could probably just call a uh, request directly. You don't have any input validation. You have no idea what methods you can use, what parameters you can provide, or even the types. And also, it returns the entire response. So if you notice in the response, there was uh, elements talking about what the ID of the request and response was and the version of JSON RPC being used. So now let's talk about step two, which is integrating the API models into this client. So currently where we're at, we can create a client with an endpoint URL and make a generalized API call. By the end of the step, what we'll be able to do is actually take a JSON model, load it, and have our new client class consume this model, such that I can make a modeled API call, which what it'll do is be able to know if it's positional or keyword arguments you need to accept, and appropriately print out just the result I wanted. And then similarly, if I, if I pass an incorrect parameter type, say like the string foo, I can't multiply one by foo, that will throw me a runtime error saying this is of type string. I expected to type integer. So in order to get this working, let's talk about an API model schema. Here's a sample API schema that we are gonna use. This is a, a lot simpler than some of the other schemas you might see out there, like in what Butter 3 uses or something like Swagger. But for the sake of this presentation, try to keep it simple. So here what I do in the schema is you can identify what the endpoint URL here is for your API. And also you can provide the operations that you may wanna provide. In our case, we only have multiply for now. And for each operation, you can specify an over, overarching uh, documentation for that method. You can specify what the input's supposed to look like and also what the outputs is supposed to look like as well. In, in terms of the inputs, you can say what the type is. In our case, it's gonna be a list and therefore we wanna have it be positional arguments. And you can also specify what the doc how you wanna describe this input as well. And you can also model what what each element in this list will be. In this case, it's integer. And then you can do the same for the output in which you get documentation and also specify it's an integer as well. So now what we're gonna do is uh, actually take this model and then try to run it through the client. Um, don't worry about trying to read through this right now. I'll go over it as well. So now what we do is if we Im import the api.json file into a model, we can now have this model modeled client class consume the model. And in an initializer, what I'll do is I'll create a param validator and a response parser, which will use the model to both validate and parse responses based off the provided parameters and the API response given back. So now what I'll do is continue on and instantiate the inherited client initializer. And then I'll be able to use the make model API call. In which case, what I'll first do is try to validate the parameters provided using the validator and the input model. Once we know these, are, these parameters are validated, we'll then use the make API call, which is inherited from the client class to, in order to actually make a request against the API. Then we'll be able to parse the response based off the model and the response given back to us, as so. Now let's talk about when he's expanded on this step. It still feels too general mainly because the API is still completely undocumented. We have no idea what methods we can provide. We have no idea what parameters and what the output is gonna be. So let's go fix this by actually adding API specific methods by dynamically creating them. So currently what we have is we can open up a model, instantiate a new client and make a modeled API call. But by the end of the step, what we'll be able to do is now use a factory function to create a new client that will actually have these new methods that we want on the client. And similarly, if we call help on the client, we can also get documentation on how, what it will actually look like. So let's uh, go over some code on how this would look. So once we load the JSON model and create the client, we will then start initializing some of the variables needed for the type call later, called later down the road in which case we just call the class name my client and set some class bases. We want it to inherit from model client in this case. And also we will 
create an empty dictionary for class properties that we want to dangle off that class. So now what we'll do is actually open up the, operate, the model and look for all the different operations available to us and call this helper function get client method. With the get client method, what it'll we'll do is actually define a new API, a new function called underscore API call in which will be used as, used by the instantiated client. So once we ret return that defined function, we attach it to, we add it to the class properties that we'll provide to type, which will actually create this new client class. And then with this new client class, we'll instantiate an instance of it. Such that now, if I call multiply of one, two, three, it's actually proxying out to this newly defined, the, the defined API call here, where self is now referring to the client that it got attached, the, the method got attached to, and the make model API call, which is what's called underneath of this function, is inherited from the modeled client class. But there's one big issue. The doc strings are still not specific. So if I try to call help on this client right now, you'll just see exactly what I described, which is multiply is just a proxy out to this underscore API call. So let's figure out how to do that. That's, it's actually not too difficult. You just add these two lines here, which we're setting the dunder name in the dunder doc for the method that we add to the class properties. Such that when we call help now, we will actually pick up these new, the new documentation and the correct name for the method. So by setting the, the dunder name right here to whatever the string operation name, it allows you to override that, uh, the fact that it looks like a proxy when you call help. And then by setting the dunder doc, you're actually able to set the documentation for that method. The get doc string method or function is pretty much what it does is it takes the operation model and looks through the, all the different documentation elements, if you remember from before the API schema, in order to, gen to concatenate together a string that has the operations and the, type, the parameter types and all the return types for you. So let's talk about what needs to be expanded off this model. First of all, it's not extensible. It's not extensible in the sense that we need to be able to support like, something like custom class names or custom inheritance in the sense that we don't want to actually only have to rely on these modeled API methods. We want to be able to add new functionality on top of it. So let's talk about step four in which we make the client extensible. Let's start with this uh, sample uh, application where I create a cache client in a sense that we know that given a, a set of a method and a set of parameters, we're gonna get the same result every single time. So it doesn't actually make sense to hit the server every single time to do it. Why not just store the, the, the result in memory and return that when needed? So with this new client cl class, I'll create a new dictionary representing the cache, and then I override the make model API calls such that I create a new cache key consisting of the method, the arguments, and the keyword arguments that I provide, and check to see if this key is in an operation cache. And if it is, I'll just print out where I'm retrieving, retrieving it from and also return the result from the cache. Then if it's not in the cache, what I'll do is I'll actually make a call to the server and get the result and store it for us. So currently where we're at, we have this logic, but there's not really a great way to actually hook in our cache client class. There's no option for us right now. So by the end of the step, what we're gonna be able to do is take this new model and then actually create a client such that we can override what the name is of the class we wanna use and its inheritance. Such that now, if I call client.multiply, you can see where it's retrieving the result from. And then if I call it again, it will actually save that result and say it's retrieving it from history. And then I can also look at what the name is as well and see that it will return my super smart client as I defined before. So how to do this? It's actually pretty straightforward. Other than updating the signature for this function, I just added this, these two lines which sets the default if no class bases were provided. In order to do that, or if now if I walk through this and I create a new client with the model and the customized uh, string name and the class bases, you can see that my super smart client gets mapped to the class name when type is called and class bases get, or the cache client tuple gets mapped to class bases when type's called. So now when I call multiply, you can see that it's appropriately using the cache client. And when I call the dunder name, it will appropriately use my super smart client for the string name. So let's talk about what needs to be expanded here. Um, to be honest, we're actually at a good base. We're, I, there's not really any glaring holes, except for the big elephant in the room, which is there's only one API method, so let's actually go fix that. So in this final step, we're gonna add more APIs such that our 
engineers um, working on the server end were hard at work and they added two new APIs, add and subtract. So um, in order to actually update this API, they updated the models as well in order to generate some of the server code. And as a result, we got these new AP API models for free. And to look at some of these API models, you can see that for add, it's very similar to multiply. In a sense, it's a list of integers and what it'll return to you is a, the sum of the integers as a single integer. Subtract is also the, pretty much the same where it's a list of integers and it will return to you the difference of those integers as well as an integer. So now let's actually do a demo of what this will look like. So if I open up IPython right here, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to import a couple helper functions. First, I'm gonna import one that lets me get my models for pre uh, pretty quickly without having to do the w opening up the files and loading it. And I'll import the create client function. So now if I open, if I call get model, what I'm gonna do first is I'm going to open up the old model, the one that only has the multiply in it. Such that when I create the client now, you can see that it only has the three methods. It has the generalized make API call, it has a modeled one, and also has a multiply. So if I call multiply now, it print out uh, the correct answer of six. But now if I try to call add or something like that, I won't be able to do it because I, the API model is not up to date here. So now let me go fix that and use the new ap updated API models that I got for free. Such that if I create this client again, and look at all the different options I have, or methods I have available to me, see, available to me. now you can see that I have add. So if I do, if I add one, one against each other, it's gonna get me two. And then if I call subtract on this instead, it appropriately shows zero. So this is really cool because I didn't actually have to write any more Python code once we, once our application was kind of built from the ground up. And adding new features in the future is not very difficult at all. So now let me get to the kind of conclusion of this talk where with dynamic class generation, I realized my sample application was super simple. It, was just adding, subtracting, multiplying numbers together. There's not really even needs to be a web API for this. But what I wanna get at is the fact that we started with an application and kind of built it to the ground up such that in order to add new functionality, all it required was updating a new model or getting a new model. Hopefully you weren't even the one had to have to update this new data source in order to pick up the new functionality. And that's really powerful, especially when you have a bunch of different other applications possibly using this similar model such that one update to the model can update and different applications that may be consuming it. Dynamic class generation produces really robust code in the end because it's a generalized uh, code path and all your logic's flowing that through that, down that. As a result, you get very well tested and heavily used code. And one thing I really didn't talk about was features and bug fixes have a w w much wider spread impact in the sense that Right now for the, the client application I wrote, it only supports JSON RPC protocol. If I was to add something like a REST JSON or REST XML or a query protocol, what that opens it up for me is to, to be able to support a bunch of different APIs that may be only running on that protocol. And then in terms of bug fixes, if I fix a bug in a certain, date, in a certain uh, code path, chances are, even though I was targeting for one functionality, if another function is using that same code path, I probably fixed a bug in there too. So I really hope you guys got a lot of uh, ideas about how class dynamic class generation works, how to use it, where would you use it, and possibly have some ideas on using it in your next big project or even current project today. Um, I would like to really thank you all for coming. If you want to look at some of the presentation code, here is the GitHub repository for that. Here is the Boda3 repository if you want to kind of look at the more nitty gritty stuff on resources in client generate dynamic client generation and also Boto Core, that's where most of the client the dynamic client generation happens. Boto 3 just kind of proxies out to that. So if you want to actually see how clients get created there, I'd recommend checking that out. Um, but otherwise, uh, I'll be here all week. So uh, if you guys have any questions about Boto 3, Boto Core, CLI, or about AWS, come find me. I'll be happy to talk about it. But that's about it. Does, is there any questions? <laughs>
Thank you very much. Uh, could you contrast this technique that you showed us uh, with uh, two other ways of doing a similar thing that is using the get at, uh, get at attribute okay. and uh, using meta classes? Yeah, so meta classes is definitely something you can actually try to use it with. Um, because in reality, type is just a meta class, right? So you could define your own meta classes if you want some specific functionality out of it as well. So like there's a bunch of different other approaches in order to dynamically generate classes. It's just type is one of them that is kind of built, set, built with, for you right out of the box. Is that good? Yeah. Anyone else? More questions? Okay, then that's lunch. Let's thank Kyle. Thank you.